Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. And my guest today is Robbie Cochran. Robbie, Hello. welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Well, thank you for being here. Um, and we are going to be talking today about slavery in the colonial period and mm -hmm. the early period of the United States. And um, instinctively, I think, when people uh, mention that subject, they think of the southern states with their mm -hmm. large uh, tobacco and cotton and yeah. rice plantations. But we're going to be talking about slavery in New England. Mm -hmm. And even more specifically, we're going to drill down and we're going to talk about slavery in right next door in our backyard in Wenham. Um, and Robbie is an authority on that subject. He's uh, written several books on the subject. And um, you actually, I'm, I don't want to steal your thumb, but you're going to talk about uh, your ancestor who was an enslaver. Um, and uh, you actually own and reside in a home that uh, uh, slaves actually lived in. And we'll, we'll get to that okay. uh, in a second. Um, but I thought that what we could do for our audience, uh, Robbie, is uh, we could put up a, a slide here. And I'll ask um, Chris to put up the slide. And uh, this is what is referred to as the slave trade triangle. And uh, if I may, what was happening, the, the, upper, the upper arrow, there were raw materials, sugar, tobacco, cotton, that were shipped from, uh, from the states and, and the Caribbean islands up to, uh, to uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. And these then were processed in the factories there into finished goods, textiles and so forth. And these were shipped down into Africa, and they were exchanged for the slaves. And then the slaves were, were sent to the, to the Americas to work the plantations where the sugar and tobacco was, was grown. So this is, this is the, the, the economic engine that, that drove that, that, whole, that whole process. And so this is a yes. bar graph that goes, each bar is a 25-year period. And it starts in 1501, and it goes through to uh, just the period just after the Civil War up to 1866. And on the left, you have the number of slaves that were imported from mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the, the, the really big period was the uh, early 18th century to the middle of the 19th century. And of course, after the Civil War, which ended in 1856, uh, the, the numbers went considerably right. down. So I, I believe uh, that the figure that I've been able to research is that about six to eight uh, million slaves yeah. uh, ended up being transported off to work in the Caribbean and, and in the plantations in, right. in, the, in the United uh, uh, States. Uh, now, now, Robbie, tell us what, what got you interested in this whole topic and got you so motivated that you wrote books about it? Well, thanks for the question. Uh, you, you mentioned in the introduction that one of my ancestors was an enslaver. Uh, that's something I discovered by accident 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, so I was aware that slavery was a thing in New England. Uh, this particular ancestor of mine lived in, in Rhode Island in the 1600s. So I was aware that, that the phenomenon existed. But it wasn't very real to me until uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was doing some research on the history of my house. Uh, I live in Wenham. My house was built in the 1600s. So I've been very curious about the history. And in that work, I discovered that an enslaved man lived there in the 1730s. His name was Pompey, P-O-M-P-E-Y. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's... Um, well, we can get to that later. Uh, and uh, I was certainly very surprised and, uh, and really dumbfounded that, um, uh, to discover this. And I wanted to learn more. I wanted to understand more about him. Uh, uh, I wanted to understand um, really where I went with it was, was he a lonely man? Did he ever get married? Did he have children? Were there other enslaved people 
in town, or, or was he the only one? Well, what a, what a research project, huh? And yeah. you know, I'm just going to hold you up on that, <clears throat> and I'm going to ask Chris, I'm going to go out of order a little bit. We discussed, <clears throat> but I, since you mentioned the house, uh, I'd like him to put up the, the picture of the, the image of the yellow house, mm -hmm. and this is the house that you live in. Right now, right? Yes. And this, what street is this on? This is on Maple Street in Maple West street. Wenham. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think what's really interesting is the two uh, uh, following images, and maybe you can talk to those, Robbie. So Certainly. could you put uh, the first uh, attic image up, and you can speak to this. So tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, th this is a very rare survivor. Uh, this is a room in the attic of our house, uh, and... Uh, What's interesting about it is, uh, and you can actually see it on the, the next image. So what we're looking at is on the right-hand side is the, 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 the sloping panel is the roof deck. Uh, and you can see some shingles uh, nailed to the underside of the roof deck to, to block any rainwater. Uh, but the important thing about this is that the room is plastered. Uh, there are plasters on the, plaster on the wall, plaster on the ceiling. And there's no plaster anywhere else in the, uh, in the attic, or there's never been any plaster anywhere else in the attic. And that tells us that this room wasn't used just for storage, mm -hmm. but it was also used for habitation. Yeah. And it's a miserable room to live in. It's beastly hot in the summer well, and imagine, bitter cold yeah. in the winter. Yeah, you can, you can imagine. Uh, and, and it's my theory that, that this is what living quarters look like for most of, uh, if not all, of Wenham's enslaved people. Yeah. Now, I, looking at, is this the way it, it looks right now? Is, yes, is your, okay. yes. And you don't have any roof leaks, do you? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> look, we took care of that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can see it looks, it looks uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty uh, yeah, iffy uh, there. So um, now tell us, um, you mentioned one of your ancestors was an was a, a, a enslaver. Yes. Uh, tell us, how did, how did you, so you started doing, you mentioned you started doing all this research, which, which I can imagine trying to find out who, what, where, were they married, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. How did you go about finding these records? What did you do? And then how did you find your ancestor? How did that Well, happen? I found out about the ancestor a while ago. Uh, and that was uh, one of my hobbies is genealogy. And I was researching an unknown branch of an unknown branch of an unknown branch of the family and suddenly discovered this thing and was, that this man wasn't a slaver. He was born in Germany in the 1600s, moved to Barbados, and then moved to, to Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet there was an enslaved man in his uh, household named Mingo who ran away. Uh, and if, uh, because... Uh, Mingo ran away, uh, the enslaver ran a newspaper advertisement, and that's how we know that Mingo existed. It was a very shocking discovery. Uh -huh. uh, uh, I have to say that. Uh, and um, I have to say that my immediate reaction to it was shame, because I, I started asking myself, well, what does this say about me, that I have an ancestor who owned an enslaved man? And it took a little while to understand that uh, it really didn't say much about me. Uh, uh, and it took me a while to understand that there's a difference between shame and embarrassment. And shame is what happens here, and embarrassment is what happens over there. And um, it was an important thing to learn. Uh, it's, it's certainly not an apology or an excuse uh, for enslavement, but it... Uh, but I think others in the audience will, can relate to this, yeah. that because uh, uh, I'm not the only one who, who, had, who lives in the area who has uh, an enslaver for an ancestor. Yeah. And it was important to understand that there is a difference between shame and embarrassment. Yeah. And embarrassment is a little bit easier to handle yeah. than shame. Yeah. Now, as we mentioned uh, earlier uh, in our introduction, most people, when they think of slavery, think of the southern states and the yes. plantations, and hardly yeah. anybody thinks up here. Have you run into other people like yourself who may have been ancestors of enslavers uh, during your research? Not yet, uh, uh -huh. and I'm, I'm hoping to. I'm hoping that uh, vehicles such as this will, will help promote that sort of conversation. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, now when, uh, you're, we're in Essex County here, Wenham is in, yes. in Essex County, so how did enslavement come up into Essex County? Because the first, you know, the, the, the slaves were taken into these southern plantations. Uh, they, they didn't need, uh, up here you, you can't farm all year round and yeah. it's a different yeah. sort of yeah. uh, uh, agriculture. 
neat. So how did it how did it end up here in Essex County? Well, it started almost at the very beginning. It started in the 1630s, uh, where the English colonists went to war with the, the Pequot people in Connecticut. Uh, and there was a, a group of soldiers from Salem who, who fought in that war. Uh, the English colonists took captive a number of Pequot men, women, and children. And uh, the men were shipped off to, uh, they're headed for Bermuda. Uh, where they were to work the English plantations that were already in Bermuda. And the, the women and children were distributed to English colonist families uh, in Connecticut and in Massachusetts as enslaved labor. And uh, at least one of them, uh, a woman who was given the name Hope, mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, was brought to Salem and was uh, given as enslaved labor for a minister who was living in Salem at the time. Mm -hmm. So the, the, these these initial the, what you're talking about these were Indians, Pequot Indians that yes. were. Uh, so they weren't they weren't what we typically think of as as people taken from Africa yes. and brought over. So so uh, this was before. So so how did how but, did the other movement? How did the African slaves uh, enslaved people come up into this area? So. Back to that ship uh, with the Pequot men who are headed to Bermuda. The, the ship captain decided, I'm actually going to go further south. We don't know why he did that. And he went down to the Caribbean where the Spanish were already in the slave right, trade. Right, right. He sold the Pequot and bought some men who had been kidnapped in, in Africa and brought them back to Salem in 1638 and okay. sold them in Salem. Okay. And uh, that was the start of it. And, and slave ships were, after that, were sailing in and out of Salem all through the 1600s and through most of the 1700s. Mm -hmm. The big, you've mentioned uh, the uh, plantations in the South. And, the, and well, first of all, I keep finding out that um, most people up here in, in the North don't know that slavery was a thing here. Yeah. Uh, that's coming as a big surprise to a lot of folks. Uh, but the second thing is that, and you mentioned the, the, the southern plantations, um, a big difference between what slavery looked like in the north versus in the south is that uh, in the north, and certainly in, in Essex County, it was typical for an enslaver to have one or two or three enslaved people, not a dozen, not two dozen, as we visualize with, with southern plantations. Yeah, hundreds of people working yeah. on a big plantation. Uh, it, yeah. And, and, and the, the big reason for that is that in the south you have four seasons of growing crops. Right. You don't have that in Essex County. Mm, not for sure. <laughs> and, it, and, and to put it very crudely, having labor that is not productive is expensive. Yeah, you gotta feed the, the people, clothe them, yeah, shelter exactly. them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now in your book you, you give um, uh, some numbers of uh, the number of, of people that yes. were uh, enslaved. And now, how did you arrive at those numbers? Say what yeah. those numbers are and, 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 and tell us how, how you arrived at those numbers. So I'm going to give you two, two numbers. First of all, uh, there is a census done by the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the, in the 1700s, in the, in the 1760s. Uh, and every town reported uh, uh, men, women, and children uh, and Wenham, uh, in Wenham's return, one in 17 residents of Wenham mm -hmm. was enslaved. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a hard number, that, uh, we, and uh, there's no uncertainty about that number. Mm -hmm. but one in 17 people. And we know what the population was. Exactly, so we, because we of that census return. Uh, okay. Uh, we know the total population, and we know the different populations by race. The, the squishier number uh, is, uh, the, uh, the, the total volume of enslaved people who lived in Wenham. I've been able to document between 110 and 120 people. There's a range because there are plenty of cases where, where you see the same given name over and over again, but, it, but it's very rare to find an enslaved person with a surname. Mm -hmm. So I can be looking at a a, a Pompey who lived in our house, and a Pompey who lived here, and a Pompey who lived there. Oh, and so they're probably under, say, underestimated. Yeah, it, am I looking at three men with the same name, yeah, or one, one man, man who's moved from, yeah, a, yeah, and exactly, so on. Exactly. So there's, a, a, there's an issue of a double counting. Yeah, right, exactly. There, there's also the issue of 
paper trails are fragile things. So I, so yes, 110 to 120 people, but I know that there are there are, there are others right. that for whom there's no documentation left. And this would be Robbie. This would be from what what time period roughly would that be? From? Uh, the, the 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 appearance in slave of yes uh, in in Wenham started in 1703. Okay. And it lingered until after the, the Revolutionary War. It, uh, after, it lingered into the early 1800s. Okay. And I, I, t I use this word lingered because there was this 50 year, 60 year period after the, the Revolution. Massachusetts Constitution was adopted in 1780, and the, the Massachusetts Constitution outlawed. Slavery. Oh, slavery, yeah. But it took 50 or 60 yeah, years okay. for cases to work their way through the court system. Sure. And for, before uh, for the, the, the various uh, courts could say, okay, well, this is what the Constitution really means. Right, right. So, so, so just doing the quick math, you mentioned from like 1703 or whatever mm -hmm. to and 50 plus 1780 is like 1830. So we're talking about 125, exactly. 130 yes. years period. Yeah. Would that be accurate? That's, a, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Now, now you are also, I don't know if we mentioned it earlier, you are also the geneolo genealogist sorry, yes. <laughs> of the Wenham Congregational Church. And you, you found out in your, in your book, I, I read that... Uh, um, a lot of the enslaved people were actually baptized and worshipped at that church. So tell us about that. The, the, this is absolutely fascinating. Uh, over half of Wenham's enslaved population was baptized by or, and or worshipped at the Wenham church. Uh, they uh, worshipped in segregated seating. Uh, but by virtue of the fact that they... Uh, were baptized by or, um, or, or even joined the church as full-blown members of the church, we have this tremendous amount of records from the church that records the, this population by name. Yeah. So we're, we're able to, 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 to see their baptismal records, their, their records for when they joined the church, when they married, when they died. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting, I mean, the fact that you... Uh, uh, or the genealogist for the church, mm -hmm. uh, that, that you had access to that. If you hadn't had that position or been interested in that, you might have missed that whole connection, correct? The, uh, that's exactly right. right. It might have uh, taken you longer. It might have taken longer. It might have taken longer to, to, to find to go it. In there. Yes. Now, now there, there's some, some interesting anecdotes and things that I, I, I'd like you to, to share with our audience. And um, you mentioned that uh, some of the enslaved people uh, fought in the um, uh, fought against the British in the Revolutionary yes. War, and and one of the one of the uh, the the people uh, that I want you to talk about is a, name, a man named Scipio Loomis. Yes, and just talk a little bit about that, and then I'll have Chris put up a couple of slides relating to that. Yes, so tell us who Scipio Loomis was, and tell us a little bit about that history. Scipio was born in Africa, 1720s or 1730s. He was abducted when he was seven years old, and brought to Salem Harbor and sold in, in downtown Salem. Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, bought by a, a family that lived in Hamilton. Uh, fast forward to the time of the, the American Revolution, 1775, Scipio runs away yep. to fight the British. Right. Uh, and now, to well, fight uh, for freedom. Okay, now let me hold you back. And I'm yes. gonna ask Chris to put up the newspaper ad. So this is a, a newspaper advertisement from 1775. Right, it says, where, ran away from me the subscriber yes. the, the, uh, on Sunday, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and, so, and, he, and the, the enslaver describes Scipio. It gives a physical description of him, 30 years old, yeah. six feet high, well set. I love this, speaks good English. <laughs> uh, he doesn't speak English well, he speaks good English. Yeah. Uh, has a couple scars on his temple. So a physical description. Yeah, so, yeah. And then and a description of what he ran away with. Yeah. And he ran away with a, oh, a must have been a trunk full of clothing. Well, a pair of black and white breeches. Breeches. And one of, of my favorites is that he had a pair of oh. moose skin breeches. Mo moose, moose skin. skin breeches, yeah. <laughs> I, can't yeah. imagine what that felt like. And, and of course, a, a felt hat, it says. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and whoever will take up said Negro and convey him to his master or commit him to jail, yes, with a G-A-O-L, for that he may be returned to me, shall have $4 reward. $4. And yes. it was signed by John Loomis, so Scipio 
assumed the last name of, of That's correct. his enslaver. That's correct. Yeah, uh, very interesting. So yeah. Cipriot ran away yeah. uh, to fight the British. Yeah. And he ended up uh, with a, a unit that was encamped on Prospect Hill in Somerville. At the time, 1775, this was just after the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, the, the British were, uh, were uh, laying siege to Boston, and there was a, the, the colonists set up a ring of fortresses ar uh, around uh, the city. Uh, either Loomis or his agent, we don't know, found Scipio in camp uh, on Prospect Hill, fighting the fight against the British, and got uh, pulled back and brought back to what, was, uh, what would become Hamilton. Yeah. From Loomis's perspective, Scipio was a problem because he ran away. Yeah. So he, he Loomis, approached uh, a, uh, his wife's cousin who lived in Wenham and, and proposed an, a trade. I will trade you Scipio if you will trade me your enslaved man. Uh, and that's what they did. Uh, Inter and so Scipio was sent to live in Wenham. Uh, and I actually believe we have a We have photograph. a picture, uh, Chris, if you could, the black and white of the house. Um, and there we, there go. we go. And that's, uh, that's so, a house in Wenham. That's on 1A, right? Is that on 1A? The, the house doesn't exist anymore. Oh, okay. uh, But the house was on 1A. Yeah. Uh, this is a photograph from 1893 of the house. And this is courtesy of the Wenham Museum. Uh, okay. We're very grateful to have photographs like this and, and others. And this is a, a rare photograph of, of uh, certainly the house didn't look like this in 1775, but it's, uh, it's a, a rare photograph of what an enslaver's yeah. house was. Yeah. Now, the, the other unusual things happened uh, uh, along that line. Tell us about the, um, uh, the Nancy Porter uh, situation yes. uh, and, and how slaves were like yes. commodities. Uh, yes. So tell us about Nancy Porter, and I think we have a picture uh, Chris can put up a picture of the two colonists I involved. So yes, yes. Talk about that, Robbie. Nancy Porter was born in 1760. Uh, and uh, when she was five years old, her Wenham enslavers gave her as a wedding present to this couple. To these two people, yeah. Uh, this couple is uh, uh, um, the, the Emersons. And uh, these are portraits that are in the collection of the Topsfield Historical Society. So we're, we're very mm -hmm. lucky to, to have uh, these, these relics. Uh, now, this gets a little complicated, but, but it, it's instructive of, of, of the times. Uh, the Wenham enslavers and the, the Topsfield enslavers were related to each other. The, the wife of the one couple and the husband of the other couple were brother and sister. Brother and sister, okay. The husband of the couple and the wife of the other couple were the brother and sister. So we have brothers oh, and sisters marrying, marrying each brothers. other. <laughs> okay. Um, and when this couple got married, uh, the Nancy was given to them when she was five years old yeah. as a wedding present. Yeah. So when we talk about enslavement, we're not talking just about buying and selling people. Yeah. We're also talking about giving people as gifts, yeah. which is and, just so hard to comprehend. Right. And Chris has just put up, you can see the yes. uh, Nancy, daughter of... Scipio, looks, Scipio. and Sarah, yes. So, Negro, servants of widow something... Lydia Porter. Porter. Lydia Porter. So, the, th so these records... Now, where did, this, th where did this come from? What, what kind of a record was this? This, uh, uh, this is a baptism record from the Wenham Congregational Church. This is an example of... This, okay. this wonderful body uh, of records, mm -hmm. uh, without which we wouldn't name, know the names uh, uh, of the people in this population. So did you? So you took out these these records and you systematically. I mean, there must have been thousands of, of baptisms, and 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 so so you were looking for things like Negro servants. Exactly. You were looking for a clue. As to, exactly. Because Nancy daughter that that doesn't tell you anything. So you were you meticulously went through these and uh, that's exactly right. What? <laughs> <laughs> Quite time-consuming. <laughs> oh boy! Um, and um, what what are some of the what are some of the I, I, well these are surprising things that we're that we're talking about the fact that 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 these were like possessions they were like come on yeah. you could you could yes. trade them you could give them yes. a, as gifts you know which just just tells you what kind of mentality. People yeah, had yeah, back uh, yeah. back then, but uh, any other overriding, overing like um, surprising things that you learned during all of your uh, all of your research, Robbie? Yeah, well, certainly the, the biggest surprise 
was the extent of the practice right here, uh, right here in Essex County and really everywhere in the North before the revolution. Yeah. Uh, I knew it existed, but I just had no idea that it was everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and in, in the case uh, for Wenham, you could not go further than four farms in any direction in town yeah. without encountering enslaved labor. Yeah. It's something that is a daily thing. I mean, I mean if you're walking around, you, it, just, it was just part of daily life. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was an, an incredible surprise. Yeah. Now, if I, I'm going to ask you kind of a, 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 a not a silly question, but mm -hmm. if, if you could go into a time machine right now <laughs> and go back to any any period of time, uh, wh where would you go? When would you go and where mm. would you go? Where would I go in a time machine? I would love to meet Pompey, the man who lived in our house. In your house. I, 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 I would love to meet him and just see what he looked like. Um, hear him, um, learn more about his life. Yeah. Uh, and after Pompey, I would want to meet another enslaved man, Samson Brown. Samson Brown is my hero. Uh, he, 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 uh, it's just a phenomenal man. And um, this is the stuff of movies. Uh, I, I, I wish I could write, if I knew how to write a screenplay. Uh, <laughs> Samson was probably born in the 1750s. One of his parents, we, we know that, one of his parents was white and one of his parents was black. Okay. We can assume that, uh, that the mother was black and we can assume that he was not conceived out of love. Mm -hmm. uh, and that probably followed him his whole life. His enslaver was a Tory. Uh, he supported, this, the enslaver supported oh, the British. Tory. Sure, yeah. And everybody in town hated him yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. for it. Samson, like Scipio Loomis, we talked about a few minutes ago, Samson ran away to fight the, to British, fight the British in the revolution. Wow. Uh, and Samson and his unit uh, went up to upstate New York uh, to fight for control of the Hudson River. During the fighting, he gets hit in the hip by a cannonball. His hip must have been shattered. And he survives. And this is 1777, so nobody gave him morphine. Yeah. I just can't imagine yeah, no, what no, the no, agony no. must have been. Yeah, medicine but, wasn't quite what it is no, today. But right? he survived it. And, and oh, by the way, the colonists won that battle and they won control of the, the, the Hudson River. But winter was coming and the, the, the theater of the war was headed south. So Samson and the rest of his unit went south and spent the winter at Valley, Valley Forge. Valley Forge, wow. With George Washington. Wow. What and he story. survived that. What a story. And I, I just have so much admiration for, for having and, gone and you, through all and that. And you know this, are there records of this? How, were there like muster rolls for people? Exactly. Who, there are muster rolls. Uh, and ah. in fact, um, Samson appears on a muster roll from just before he and his unit uh, went to Valley Forge. Uh, and there are, uh, there's, uh, Later in life, he applied for a pension because he was a Revolutionary War veteran. Veteran, yeah. And it's the application for the, the pension gives the details about what happened. Yeah. Now, this muster roll, the, the, the written document, you didn't find that here. You must have gone some to some federal uh, uh, agency or museum or something. Actually, it's the Massachusetts Archives, uh, oh, okay. uh, the state archives. Uh, as there's uh, quite an extensive collection of muster rolls of, uh, of Massachusetts units of uh, soldiers. Wow. Um, that too was a, a, a time consuming exercise. Okay. <laughs> going now, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show for our audience and I hope, uh, I hope uh, Michelle can, um, can zoom in on this. Um, so this is um, a, a, a one of the books that, mm -hmm. that you have published uh, and it's called uh, Enslaved People and Wenham. This is one of the three books you've written. Now, if, if one of our uh, viewers is interested in getting this book, how, how, could they, how can they get a copy of this book? Well, well this and my other books about Wenham's history are uh, available on barnesandnoble.com. Barnesandnoble.com, um, okay. It's available online. You can't buy it in the stores. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
and uh, and if they come over to you, they can you'll give them an, uh, an autograph. I would be happy to autograph copy. Well, this has been this has been fascinating. I think the the half hour just flew by, yes. Robbie. Uh, just fascinating. Uh, maybe we'll have to have part two, and and you can <laughs> tell some more of these stories. This is something that, of course, most people have no idea that uh, the slave yes. trade was uh, was all the way up here into New England. Well, thank yeah. you very much. Thank, thank you, you all. It's been a pleasure. Much. And I'd like to remind our viewers that, that you have been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.